morning. Happy Advent. It's good to see you. Y'all came back. Wow, putting out extra chairs again. This is crazy. This is my favorite time of year. It's no secret. I love Advent, and I love the Christmas time, and I hope you do too. This is that, that strange, awkward place between where we know what has happened and where we know what is about to come. And we join with ancient Israel in the longing. In fact, last week, you may remember, we learned that the Latin term Advent actually means the coming or the arrival, right? Like it's pending, it's imminent, it is, it is coming, all right? And, that, and we look forward to that. Not only that, celebrating looking backwards, but we look forwards, right, to the second Advent when we know the King of Kings returns again. And it is going to be awesome. Last week, we looked at the arrival of hope and we lit the hope candle. Today, we explore the arrival of love. And in a few minutes, we're going to light the love candle, the candle that that represents, because love arrived in human form in a manger. Now, let me see how awake we are. If you recognize who this is, shout out who this is by name. Anybody? The Grinch. You're a mean one, right? You know you're singing it. How many people know if this guy loved Christmas or not? Did this guy love Christmas? No, no. In fact, oh, at the end, he didn't like Christmas at first. But something happened. Something happened. You remember, his heart grew three sizes that day. It was one of those beautiful things on the left. You see it there. What kind of love can melt this heart? What kind of love is it that can turn this frown upside down to be the happy Grinch? It's the love we celebrate today, the coming of the king, born in a manger. More than 2,000 years ago, love arrived in human form when a star appeared in the east and it guided them. It was a beacon and took everybody to the newly arrived Messiah. It was a star that guided people back then, and it's a star that still guides people today. And it is so exciting. Today, we're going to light that next candle. Let me have my volunteer come up today, and we're going to light the second candle in the four candles that we have here. The second candle is the candle of love. All right, look at you. This one right here. You got it? Get a good picture of this, anybody? All right. Pull hard. You got it. Let me know if you need help. If you need help, I can I can step in. Here, let's let's bend this just a little bit. Ready? Got it? All right, here you go. You take it. Yes. Got it. Awesome. Give her a hand, guys. Thank you so much for helping. Beautiful. We light the second candle, the candle of love. And we follow the star this morning on this journey. The star should remind us all of the brightest love, the love that never gives up, the love that conquered sin and death and the grave, and aren't you glad it did? Because that means we have a chance at redemption. And this love hopefully fills us every day, and it also will fill us for eternity, and I am so excited. When you think of the word love, what is it that pops into your mind? Maybe you have a mental picture. Maybe you think of something all the time when you hear the word love, and oh, that's, you know, maybe you picture a big heart. Maybe you picture the Grinch's heart swelling three times this size that day. Everybody has something in their mind when they think of the word love, but this is a word that I think we use a lot, and being honest, I think we overuse it sometimes, and we trivialize it. Maybe it's watered down and lost a little bit of its meaning because we use it in all kinds of things every day. We say things like, I love God, and I love Vienna sausages, <laughs> but do we love them the same? I hope not. <laughs> Man, if you do, something's out of whack. Come see me after church. We say, I love my spouse. And we say, I love pizza. Man, I hope you don't love them. I'm like, well, are we talking cheese stuffed crust? You know, pepperoni and maybe. No, no, no not you, baby. <laughs> I didn't say I love my wife. I said I love spouse. This is, this is generic, see. It's never about us. You're safe here. It's the potter's hand way. It's always about them, right? This doesn't apply to us. We're just studying together today. We say things like, we love our pets, yet we love popcorn. <laughs> Do we love them the same? Man, I, I hope not. We love our pets, and how can we not love our pets? This time of year at Christmas, they are adorable. This, this beautiful face right here, look at this poor innocent guy. Oh, I'm so glad you're home. The Christmas tree fainted. I... I have no clue how this happened. I am so glad, Master, that you are home because this, this tree just, just faded. And it's not just the dogs. May the Lord be gracious to you if you have cats. 
because cats will mangle your ornaments. So Christmas tree, your ornaments are history. Just Google it on YouTube and you will see cats destroying things left and right. So we're an equal opportunity offender here at the Potter's Hand. Cats and dogs alike. Even Grumpy Cat gets into it. They never let poor play in it good. He can't play. This is, this is what we do. We spend, wait for it, $60 billion a year on our pets. 60, not 60 million. That'd be enough. $60 billion. Billion. Now listen, I love pets as much as anybody. I mean, I, when we had them, before we had allergic kids, you know, they were all allergic to them and stuff. They slept in the bed with us. We like, we bathed them. We took them out. We put them in the seat belt and all that stuff. I mean, we, were, we, we got it. I mean, I love, believe me, I love everything. I love the, the cats, the dogs, the fish, the lizards, the chalupas, you name it. I love those. <laughs> chinchilla, chinchilla, chinchilla. <laughs> chalupa is something you get at McDonald's or Taco Bell, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> I do love chalupas too, but I just making sure you're listening. I love them as much as the next person, but 60 billion worth? For animals, let's be honest, we got to walk them. We got to clean up after them. We got to vacuum the hair. We got to clean out the fish tank. We got to go apologize to the neighbors for them. We got to disguise medicine in little pieces of cheese and stuff it in their mouths. And shouldn't they be paying us? If we think about this, the pets, why do we do this? Why do we spend our hard-earned money and our time caring for them? It's not because of anything they've done to earn it. It's because we simply love them. Does that sound familiar? See, I'm going somewhere with this. Love is powerful. Now think about that. Think about the love a parent has for their child. And there is nothing you wouldn't do for your child. As a parent, you think, man, I will sacrifice for them. If need be, I will even die for my child. That's powerful. It's even true in the animal world. I mean, think about this. There is nothing more dangerous than you're walking through the woods and you stumble upon and surprise a bear. Uh, wait, sorry. There's nothing more dangerous than when you walk and stumble upon a mama bear with her grizzlies, right? Don't believe me? Just ask the National Geographic people who stumbled upon this. I'm telling you, go try to take a fish out of the hands of a baby bear and watch what happens to you. You will set a brand new land speed record for sprinting. You know why? Because nothing will motivate you like having a 800-pound killing machine unlock your potential as you run away. Why is that? Because they, by instinct, are serious about their children. They protect their cubs. Now apply that to us. And you begin to just get a tiny bit of a glimpse of what real love is when we think how protective we are how sacrificial that love is we have for our children. Now, take it even deeper and apply that to the Lord. And then you start to truly grasp the depth of love he showed when he wanted to willingly allow his son to be born so that he could die for us. That is love. And that is the, exactly the kind of love we celebrate this Advent season. A love so powerful that it broke through time and space, and God wrote himself into the story to redeem us from sin, from the darkness, to light our way. That is real, pure, authentic love. And we're going to dive deep into that love today as we explore this theme of love entering our world through his son. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Pull up your favorite Bible app while you do that. Let me welcome our online campus each week. Great to have you. If you're out of town, travel safely. Hurry on back. Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to read here about a love that was present not just in the manger, but long before. And I think we forget that. All throughout the Old Testament, like just read Psalm 139, and you will see how God knew us. He knew us intimately before we were even born, back before even the womb. Here the Apostle Paul takes that, and he goes a step further. Read with me in Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in what? Love. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Wow. Y'all, there is a lot going on here. There are some really deep truths and some big words. 
If you're an English teacher, or maybe you're just, you're just a good student, do you notice anything a little strange about this whole thing as it goes on and on? And it's a run-on sentence. Not only that, it's the mother of all run-on sentences. Did you know in the original Greek New Testament, there's not even a period here? And we, we hit this already running. Look at verse 4. See the ellipsis? We're already hit this already in progress. This goes on and on for 12 verses without a stop. It is the longest, it holds the record, no joke, of the longest single thought in all of the Greek New Testament. This is it, the record holder. It goes on and on and on without stopping, just one thing after another. It's almost as if Paul is so stinking excited about love that he just goes on and on. He's like, and another thing, and God's love, it's so great, and this, and he protests, and Jesus, and he's just blah, blah, and he can't stop, and he goes on and on for 12 full verses. We add periods and commas and stuff like that just so we can take a breath. That is a man who grasps just a little bit of God's love. Paul is so excited, he doesn't even wait to take a breath until he communicates everything God has for you. Now, here's an interesting thing. He uses a very loaded word here, a word that is so misunderstood and misinterpreted, it's a dangerous word. In our English language, that word is predestined. Thankfully, that's not the word Paul uses in the original Greek. He uses a word called proorizo. Proorizo. Say it with me. Proorizo. Oh, Greek scholars, I love it. This literally means to mark out the boundaries ahead of time. As if you're on a football field and you want to mark out where the end zones are and you paint the lines and you go like that, you mark it out ahead of time. It doesn't say you dictate the game. Ooh, pastor, are you going to talk about predestination? Are you really working predestination into an Advent sermon? No, I'm not. I promise. We're not going to go there. That would take a full sermon just in and of itself. So suffice it to say, hear me. In this context, say in this context, in this context, this means, especially, I was reading Dr. Jeremiah, I love how he puts it. He says, in this context, it simply means that God the Father chose his people for a purpose, and he determined his purpose would be their adoption as sons and daughters into his family. How awesome is that? We can be grafted by faith into his family, giving you all the rights and all the privileges of being in a family, including unlimited access to the Father. How amazing is that? It is the greatest Christmas present ever. We're not talking about a distant God. We're not worshiping some baby that lived and died, and you can go and visit his bones in his tomb today. It is empty, and it is amazing. Now, I want to caution us. We often talk about the Christmas season as the time when love came down, and I get that. We sometimes will say things like, that's when God's love entered the world as a baby. And, and that's all true, but we do a disservice if we only focus on it like it's a new thing. We, if we don't pull back and take the God's eye view of this and look at it from the, the longer view, a view back to the beginning of the world, we miss the truth. That is our first truth for us today. God's love existed from the start. This is key. You have to grasp this. This is what separates our faith from every other faith. God's love for you existed from the start. The history of the world, I mean, the entire Bible is a story of love from the first day of creation. God's love for his people had his plan for redemption to bring us back from the beginning. And frankly, we don't grasp that. We hear it, and some of us are even nodding, possibly today, like, I think I get it, but it's real easy to think you get it here and not have it translate. We don't understand love like that. We're so much more accustomed to human love, right? Right? how we deal with each other. But man, let's be honest. Human love is fickle. Woo! Human love is unpredictable. I learned that hard lesson in third grade because I wrote a note to a girl. It wasn't Amy, but I can, I can gesture because I married this one. And it said, do you love me? Check yes, no, or maybe. She checked maybe. What is wrong with her? I tell you, I, I'm not bitter. See, this is how we view love, right? We relate it to human standards because that's what we know. But that's not how God loves. That is not his kind of love. God is not some crazy uncle that's going to show up at the party with a jello mold and you don't know what to do with it. You, you know what I'm saying? We think of love like that. Or God, on the other extreme, is not some miserly, curmudgeonly old man who's kind of got a, a few gold coins, and if you're really nice, 
He might flip you one. Please, sir, may I have some more? That's not God's love. That's what we have made God's love. Aren't you glad God's love is not like Cousin Eddie or Scrooge? God's love is so much better, so much deeper. Even though, yeah, we celebrate it crashing into the stable that morning in Bethlehem, it was there long before. That birth is the culmination of his love, writing himself into the story so he could buy us back from our own sin. His love is on display for us, and that's what Advent season is all about. But hear me, his love is nothing new. It has always been, which brings us to the second truth. God's love does not depend on us. Ooh, and I am so glad it doesn't depend on us. God's love is not something you have to earn. It's not something you have to perform for. It's not something that you have to maintain, and you wonder, was I good enough today to earn your love? Remember, God first loved us, even when we were unlovable. Maybe we still feel unlovable. Maybe we're still dealing with feelings of guilt and God, how can, how can you love us? I don't understand because his love isn't dependent on you. That, that's a deep love. His love supersedes our love. He loves us even if we didn't love him. He first loved us. His love was there from the beginning of time, and it will continue throughout eternity. Wrap your mind around that. That is incredible love. And it's hard to accept this truth, but here, if you could take anything away, take this. God's love for us exists beyond our own limited understanding. It exists beyond the constraints we put of time and space and our finite minds. God's love is worth focusing on and meditating on. And yes, today it is worth basking in. Like when you walk out of a freezing cold room and you go into the sunshine and you just pause for a moment. Or you take 30 minute long hot showers. Is Marin in here? Okay, good. She's not. Let's talk about, no, I'm just kidding. This is, this is one of those things that I feel that basking in that, that hot shower, that love. That's how God's love. As we study it more, you'll learn something else. God's love is so not like ours. God's love is different, and it is distinctive. That means it's unique. Don't try to equate it to the love you have for each other, for a spouse. It is so much better than that. It is so unlike any love we've known, because our human love is so up and down, and it depends sometimes on how people treat us. It's unpredictable, and it's fickle. Have you ever known someone who had a hard time accepting love? You ever known someone maybe who, be honest, it's okay, you don't, you don't have to raise your hand. You ever known someone who you had a hard time loving? I mean, it's like, I'm trying really hard to love you, but man, you get on my nerves. You ever, oh, is it just me? Sorry, too honest? Okay, all right, I'll back it up. We'll put it back into the hypothetical. Have you ever known someone that maybe didn't love God, or maybe for whatever reason, their past or whatever, they felt like God couldn't possibly love them. If you have walked this earth any time, you have met someone who had answered yes to at least one of those questions. Despite what we know in our minds or believe in our hearts, if we're honest, there is a daily struggle to live with the reality of God's unlimited love for us. It is so different from our own fallen human ability to love. And I bet it's vastly different than some people in here and how they relate to their families. Maybe you didn't have a great loving relationship, and the whole idea of identifying with a heavenly Father who loves you is, is foreign and hard. So let me remind you, God loves you, and you can't earn it. He will not love you more no matter what you do, and he cannot love you less. That's not like my love may not be like yours. That's why it's different. That's why it's so distinctive. It is so amazing. Not anything we've done, not anything we can do. He's not some grumpy guy who's going to love you today, but take it all back tomorrow. I am so glad that no matter who's hurt you, no matter how people have abused you or, or twisted the whole concept of love, you can find true and pure love right here. And that is God's love. It is pure when no other love is. It is perfect when no other love is. It is not in part. It is whole. And it is also holy. God's love is lavish. And you don't have to earn it or muster it up or wonder when you lay at bed at night, Lord, was I good enough to earn your love today? That's bondage, and that comes from the devil. 
That is not how he loves us. And once we grasp that, then we want to pour that out to others. And we want to show that and show this unending love. No matter where you are on the journey, God's love is for you. It is not against you. It is more vast and perfect than you can possibly grasp. And I want to point that out today. This side of heaven, it may be tough for you to grasp, to wrap your heart and your mind around, but we can receive that love and be drawn even deeper into love. For those who put their faith in Christ, for those who willingly don't miss this, acknowledge their sin and repent of it and say, I recognize what your standard says, Lord. I hear it, and I agree with you on it. See, we don't hear that in the pulpits today. That's, that's that easy believism, sugar-coated garbage. Just love each other. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> We're in this together. This is where the rubber meets the road, where we say, God, you have shown me in your word. You have held up the mirror, and I see my sin, and I don't hide it, and I don't disagree. I agree with you, and I, from this moment, go this way, 180 degrees. If you haven't done that, you are missing the depth of God's love. That's your part in it, to embrace it, to accept it. Can you look back in your life and remember a time? If you haven't, you need to do that. Come take my hand. I'll stay after church as long as you want. Talk to somebody you trust and say, what is this about this repentance and this forgiveness of sins that we can have? That's the other side of the coin that people miss. Yeah, God is love, but he's also a God of justice. That's where the mercy comes to cover our sin. His shed blood on the cross. He was born to die. Which leads us all to my favorite one, the next truth. God's love is deep. It is so deep. God's love is the standard, okay? It is the standard. Not my love, not your love. God's love is the standard. That is what we are supposed to show the lost world. That is what we are supposed to emulate. We're supposed to demonstrate that love. So I got to ask you, I'm sorry, I have to do this. How deep is your love? <laughs> that's terrible. I, was, I couldn't resist. When I was preparing this and I thought that, I said, that's it. I'm showing the Bee Gees. How deep is your love? How deep is your love? Is your love? Now you can sing it all week because I have been and it is only fair. How deep is your, yes, Pastor Matt just showed the Bee Gees. It's a great question. Let me ask you this. How deep is your love for your neighbor? How deep is your love for your coworker, the one who shares an office or a cubicle? How deep is your love for that family member that's always annoying? The one who wears the kind of see-through white sweater with the dicky and the, t- the turtleneck and stuff, you know, the cousin Eddie we're talking about? How deep is your love for that when you know you're already dreading going there? We're going to talk about this in a minute in my challenge. Oh, it's going to be so good. How deep is your love for each other? See, if you continue on in Ephesians to chapter 3, Paul does something remarkable. Paul stops talking, and he starts praying. And he prays this incredible prayer, one of the most beautiful prayers in all of Scripture. In fact, I'm going to put it up for you. Read this with me, Ephesians 3, starting in verse 17. He says, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that, get this, surpasses knowledge, remember that, that you may be filled somewhat, that you may be filled just a skosh, You may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. We're talking about how vast he is, and he's saying, I want you to be filled to that measure. Not just a little trickle, not just a little dabble, do you? But the full measure that surpasses knowledge. God love is it's wide, it's long, it's high, but it's that last word I want to focus on. Deep. Whoo! What comes to your mind when you hear the word deep? Thank you. Exactly. For me, I immediately go back to my childhood. Boom. And I'm in the Bahamas on a, the only time I left the country to go for vacation to this thing. And I was just a little scutter, about eight years old. And I had two torturous brothers, I mean, two older brothers that loved to torture me, pretty much. And they took me out on this, a Hobie catamaran. 
Anybody ever been on one of these? Two holes, right? Do, do they still make Hobie? Is Hobie still a thing? Okay. Well, this is like in the 70s, and we're on this thing. And they said, come on, we're going to go. So remember, this is like a 12-year-old, an 11-year-old, and like an 8-year-old. Alone. On a catamaran in the Caribbean. And we're going out, and I'm looking down, and I see this beautiful sand. And you can see the bottom. And it, it looks like it's two feet away. And you can see fish and all kinds of things swimming around. There's a barracuda. And you're like, ooh, this is cool. And it didn't matter how far you went out. You could see this beautiful emerald crystal clear water. It was so amazing. And we just started going and going and didn't really pay much attention to how far we'd been going. At least I didn't because I was with my brothers, and they would never steer me wrong. I hope you're watching. And we're going hundreds of yards into hundreds of yards, and I'm looking down at the bottom, and then all of a sudden, something happens. Oh, the bottom disappears. And we had crossed what my brothers tortured me with, the drop-off. And it freaked me out. I didn't like it. I reached, I hugged that hole, and I started getting mad. I'm, you turn this around. You're going to do it. I'm telling mom, you better turn this around. We're in the drop. We're going to die. It's, 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 it's 15,000 fathoms, Steve. We've got to die. Turn it around. And they didn't. I got madder and madder, and finally, they had mercy, and they took me back. And I remember, when I think of deep, I think of where that water just disappeared. And it went from bright, shiny emerald where I think I could dip my toe in and touch the bottom to where there was nothing, pitch black. And it freaked me out. And as dark as that is, that is nothing compared to the deepest place on this planet. That is nothing compared to the Marianas Trench. Oh, you want to talk about deep. The deepest place on recorded on, on the globe is right there just to the Philippines and south of Japan. And it is an amazing place. It is so deep that scientists today still consider it largely a mystery. And they don't understand all that. They call it unknown because they have only managed two fully manned trips to the deepest part of this. Two. And it is so profound, and it is so frightening, and it is pitch black, and it is such a mystery. If Mount Everest, the tallest thing we know, okay, five miles, if Mount Everest were taken and dropped into the depths of the deepest part of the Marianas Trench, it would still be one mile under the surface. Wrap your head around that. Over here on the right, this is how far down the Titanic rested. Right there. That's the trench. Here's Mount Everest. It's still another mile before you get to the surface. And I think we view God's love like that. Like we know it, and we've got some stats about it, and we think, oh, yeah, God loves us. Yeah, God, he loves me, Jesus loves me. We sing it, surely we believe it. But I don't think, with all these stats, I don't think we really grasp the depth of this kind of love. I think sometimes God's love feels like the Marianas Trench. It is so deep that it is unfathomable. I think we can study it and we can learn about it, but we're uncomfortable with this because Paul calls it, it's love that surpasses knowledge. It is this beautiful description of it, but think about this. God invites us into the depths of his love, and he's so incredible and so gracious that he doesn't overwhelm us with his power. He goes the other way, and he becomes a tiny baby to overwhelm us with his love that way. It doesn't scare us. He doesn't blow us away. He doesn't say, I am here, and we all die and vapor because God's love is so amazing and his holiness. We can't even look at it and live. He doesn't do anything. He comes fully and deeply just as possible as a human so that we can experience him. And he becomes vulnerable. And it is beautiful love, as Paul said, beyond measure. God's love doesn't change, even if our feelings do, even if we feel distant today, and some of us do. God's love doesn't change. It's right there waiting for you to turn around and grab it and let it sustain you through this journey. In the right timing, just like he did with Israel, the Messiah showed up. And don't think for a minute that they didn't have doubts. Don't think for a minute that Israel thought, 400 years of silence from God is awesome. Some doubted. When's the Messiah coming? You, you've been talking about Isaiah. You've been prophesying this. We've got ever so many, um, the minor prophet. We've got all kinds of people. Talk. Has anybody seen the Messiah? Maybe we missed it. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe we're not God's chosen people. Who knows what they thought? 
They waited a long time, and I'm sure they grew weary, and I'm sure some of them questioned God. It's not wrong to have questions. It's wrong to keep your questions. Find the answers. In the right time, and God showed up, and his love delivered its full culmination in the manger. And it was incredible. God made flesh, love coming down to us. Some people say it is God's love on display with skin on. I love that. Nothing can shake it. And it is awesome. And then Paul goes and he gives this description in Romans 8. And I love this. He says this, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, there's that word, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. The love of God in Christ Jesus. Ooh, well, that separates things. That kind of sounds like Jesus actually meant what he said when he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Because I'm the one who willingly put skin on and came into this game, and I bought you back with my precious blood. That is love, and it is incredible. And today, I want to issue a challenge. We're going to end this service in a rather unorthodox way. Usually, I call people forward. We come pray. Today, I'm going to send you out. I'm going to issue a chance for you to do one of three things, and each one is different. You can pick one, two, or three all of them, none of them, that's up to you. There is no guilt here. We don't do that at the potter's hand. I'm merely setting the table and issuing a challenge if you want to accept. I'm going to walk you through this, okay? And if the first one's not for you, hang on, okay? We're going to walk through this, and I'm not going to call you forward. I'm going to send you out after this. We have a chance to put God's love into action because it's not good enough just for us to know about it. It's not good enough. This little light of mine, I'm going to hide it. It's for me. Squeeze. We're supposed to go and share it. So what we're going to do, I was praying about this this week, and I honestly feel convicted that the Lord showed me something, and that is we're supposed to love those in Jerusalem, Judea, and all of Samaria, home, city, worldwide. That's how that translates. And we don't know enough about our neighbors. We don't know enough about our immediate neighbors. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do something called loving our neighbors. If you're here Wednesday night, you got a sneak peek of this. I need your help. Next Sunday, I need as many people as are willing to bring to church a plate of your favorite baked goods. Not a pot roast, okay? Not a quiche. Sweet stuff, okay? Brownies, cookies, fudge, your favorite Christmas recipe. Please don't bring a fruitcake. We want to show love to people. Okay? We are not here to anger them. Okay? Nobody needs another paperweight. When we bring these, by the way, if you make fruitcake, I'm sure it's delicious. Okay? I'm just, I just want to say this. We are going to try to go next door and love our neighbors. I'm not talking about the houses over there. We're talking right now in, in our city. This building has doubled. I don't know if you noticed the new construction. Tenants are getting ready to move in. There are people who have moved in across the street, and over there, there's over a dozen tenants and neighbors. I know almost none of them, and I bet you're in the same boat. And God spoke to me, and he says, you talk about preaching love to your neighbors, and you don't even know who runs the plumbing thing next door? And God spoke to me. I said, you know what? We're going to fix that. We're not going to go ask for a thing. We're going to bring a plate full of cookies or brownies with just a note that says, Merry Christmas from your friends at the potter's hand. I'm not going to ask for a thing. It's just going to open the door and say, we're here. We're your neighbor. We love you. These businesses right here. If you bring them Sunday, we will get them delivered on Monday, okay? We'll have some youth come up. If you want to be a part of it, you're welcome to. Maybe mid-morning, if you can't bring it Sunday and you're out of town, but you will be here Monday, bring it Monday morning. We need several, several, several dozen brownies, cookies. Bring them in a simple paper plate with saran wrap. Do they still make saran wrap? Is it called that? I don't know. That clear plastic stuff? If you put it over that so we can divvy it up, that's the challenge one. Will you help? Can you bake? You don't want me being the only one. Trust me, Okay. This next Sunday, and then on Monday, we're going to go, and we're going to deliver them to all the businesses around the potter's hand. And we're going to say, Merry Christmas. We love you, and we're going to have a nice card. That's challenge number one. Challenge number two is the blessing tree. I don't know if you noticed it, but it's up, and we have a way to anonymously bless people who have less than we do. 
this is an awesome one. There are 65 white cards. I could see maybe half of them have already been taken, and that is awesome. This is an anonymous way, and not one thing listed on that tree that you can purchase for somebody is over $25, okay? If you want to give more, take more. When you take a card to bless somebody, right next to the tree, you'll see a table with a list. You just need to write down what it is you took so that they know, so that we can keep it up, so that little Johnny doesn't get just nothing but Barbie dolls or ladies' socks. We've got to make sure everything is synced up, okay, because we don't use names. Everything's handled very anonymously through numbers. This is a big chance to bless somebody. Let me just be very candid with you. Not long ago, somebody put my family on that tree when we were having a tough time. And I'll never forget it. It was life-changing, the impact that had on me and our kids. You want to talk about showing love? You come downstairs and there's stuff under the tree that there ain't no way you had a chance to get. You want to talk about tears of joy? The blessing tree. I love it. Y'all have done over 100 shoe boxes and blessed people way over there. We've got more coats, more Christmas winter clothes that we're distributing to people who don't have enough than we've ever had. And now we have the blessing tree. Take that on your way out. You have two or three weeks that you can get that done. It is going to be awesome. Which brings us to the third challenge. We've had some generous people, several generous, generous people come forward and donate cash. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to help you be a blessing to somebody else. We don't have enough cash for everybody, but we do. <laughs> Sorry, Eric. <laughs> but, but it looks so bummed on the front row. But we do have a significant amount. And it is being distributed throughout this room very randomly. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to, when you get this card, I want you to open it up, and I want you to look at it. And then I want you, between the time you walk from here to your car, to just pray a simple prayer. God, how can I use this to bless somebody else? It may mean you want to take it and go and walk and take something off the blessing tree. God may put somebody on your heart right now. God may put somebody on your heart that you've never met. It may mean going and getting a gift card or five smaller ones, and you go to Lifeway and buy a box of Christmas cards that have Scripture on them, that you go put it in, and you take them to the nursing home. Some people who have been overlooked or the widow or someone who is hurting and doesn't, frankly, like the Christmas season because it's all about being lonely to them. You have a chance to be a blessing to somebody, okay? Maybe you want to use it as seed money and you add something to it and go lavishly and ridiculously generously bless somebody. Some of you have already done that, and it's awesome. I am so so proud in the good way to be your pastor. When we are getting the reputation of being a church, you can say what you want about us. You're generous and you're faithful. And that speaks volumes to a lost and dying world. And I pray that you keep that up. So here's what we're going to do. In the words of the great theologian, Oprah Winfrey, everybody check under your seats because somebody on your row has something, okay? Maybe two people, you're going to have to pull. There's an envelope. You're going to have to pull hard. We're going to start the Christmas music, and I'm going to dismiss you now and go be a blessing. Go love somebody. Go make somebody's week and be a blessing, all right? You guys are dismissed. You can compare notes. There's two on every row unless you're on the front row. Check every chair. If it's not your chair, it's somebody else's. God bless you guys. Go be a blessing.